Today we're celebrating the 18th Sabbath. Uh, and someone will do the math. I guess we got 41 Sabbaths less, left to go in order to complete this 49. Uh, is it 49 Sabbaths? 30? I don't know. Somebody with the math will do, do, the, do the job for us. How many? Yeah. All right. But today is the 18th of the 49 Sabbaths, I, I think, that we are, we're looking to complete. And we want to celebrate uh, this Sabbath. Um, and in celebrating, I'd like to give the subtitle of what we're doing today. Uh, well, there are two titles. One is the uh, celebration of the White Stone Sabbath, which we want to call this 18th Sabbath. And then, of course, the celebration of the uh, Hamite the Hamite. Uh, Triangle of Men, of the Hamite Trinity. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, and our verses, for those who keep track of such things, in Revel Exodus chapter 2, verse, chapter 20, rather, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the Sabbath day is holy unto the Lord. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, with respect to he that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and a white stone. And what I want to ask the question, is this the white stone that is mentioned? Let me read that in uh, Revelation chapter, uh, chapter two. <clears throat> Revelation chapter two, yes. Um, let's start at, at uh, what, 17? He that hath an ear, let him hear. Um, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Make note of that in terms of our teaching now as item or gift or prophecy number one. Let's call it gift number one uh, as we teach. And uh, the rest of the verse after that of the, of the eating will I give to eat of the hidden manna will I give to him a white stone? Let's make that number two, gift number two. In addition to gift number two, uh, and in the stone a new name. Uh, so that's all part of two, which no man knoweth, I'm sorry, that's three, pardon me. A new name which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. So, the gift number two of the giving of the white stone, is this lectern, is this the white stone that is mentioned in the ancient texts of the book of Revelation given to the John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos uh, nearly 2,000 years ago. Is this stone, this marble, this this lectern, is this that white stone? And we want to examine that. You have probably been listening to me over the last week and I have been making assertions and affirmations that it is. But I want to leave the opportunity for you uh, to raise the question. I'm not going to force my beliefs upon you whether this is that white stone. Of course, you will notice the name that's written on the stone. There is at least a name written on the stone. But the name written on the stone, the Bible says, will be a, a new name. Now, the name written on this stone is Jesus. We'll talk about whether that's the actual name or whether that's a different name or whether that disqualifies the fact that the name of Jesus is written on the stone disqualifies this as the prophetic white stone. And we'll try to examine that and you'll come to your conclusions about it. I've already come to mind, but uh, the question is, and is, is this that white stone? And then the other question that perhaps we uh, could raise is the word atla, the hidden manna that's mentioned in gift number one, and to the revelator, to John the revelator, that he would be given to eat of hidden manna. Uh, we've gone through the explanation of what manna is, that it's uh, composites, a composition, uh, does not meet any of the requirements on the earthly or universal uh, element chart. 
that all of the elements that consist of the atoms that make up whatever it is, whether it's wood or iron or steel or water or glass or flesh, all come from the element chart of all things created during the six day creation. But manna does not come from any of the elements of, that's on the element chart, meaning that it was not a part of the initial six days of creation. We've affirmed as well that uh, everything that was created was sustainable by itself, that it needed nothing further to sustain it. That God's purpose in creation was that he gave the pear tree a seed, the apple tree a seed, he gave the woman a seed, he gave the, the waters, the clouds for the oceans and rivers, and everything is sustainable. In other words, God need not come back on the eighth or ninth day and replenish the earth or restock the earth. That was Adam's job. But everything that was needed was completed in the elements or the element chart as we understand it to continue uh, the universe, uh, the earth, if you will, without interruption. Manna was not a part of that process. Manna was not a part of the elements. It, I don't know if it has an even atomic base as a neutron and a proton, pro, neutron and protons as, as atoms generally do that consist of all things in the element chart. So, but it was given from heaven directly without seed. And when they crossed over Jordan, the Bible says in the book of Joshua that the manna ceased and no more manna has been seen on planet earth since that manna ceased on that day crossing the Jordan River with Joshua and that crowd. And um, having said that, then the Lord says it, nearly 100 years after his birth, and 60 years after his ascension, that he would give to the man that overcometh the opportunity to eat of hidden matter, this exclusive and unusual, if you will, non six day creation process that does not meet any of the requirements of, of creation itself, that he would be given to eat of that hidden manna. That's what they ate in the wilderness for 40 years. That sustained them and their feet did not swell, their shoes did not wear out, their clothing did not wear out as well, eating that manna, it was so powerful. But God said he will give to him that overcometh uh, to eat of that hidden manna. And so we have raised the question as to whether or not the word atla that we have here um, on the wall um, is that the hidden matter. And one could argue, well, Pastor, why didn't you write Atla where you wrote Jesus? And, and we'll, we'll, we, we can argue that. We can talk about whether or not the name Jesus disqualifies anything. But we do have the name Atla written, and it's written and it's clear. Is that Atla a hidden matter? Because as you've heard me say, over the past 30 years that the, word, the name was given to me and no man nor angel had ever heard the sound Atla till God spoke it to me. And so um, we want to be able to raise the questions. We've gone through 30 years of my teaching about Atla. I don't know what your beliefs are about it. I'm not sure. Uh, but now we have to raise another question. Is this lectern the white stone? that is referenced uh, in the book of Revelation that we just read. Um, I can tell you this, uh, that I believe that Atla is the hidden manna. I affirm that this is that white stone. You know, I, I have to tell you that in first reading the scripture and making note of it some time ago, you might remember, I said when I graduated high school, I went in a different direction than all other high school students when they were or, or, issuing class rings at that time, most people went with the rubies, red stone, and I decided to go with a pearl, a white stone. Someone stole the ring from me sometimes later. And I talked about that, but I realized that that was a bit insufficient in terms of supplying the, uh, the adequacy of the scripture and meeting that requirement of giving the white stone. And little did I know until a prayer meeting this week that we have this stone that we have a white stone. I never paid any attention to it. I mean, obviously it was something that we desired. I designed this from soup to nuts. You see it's complete design it was created by me. 
um, and, then cre and then fashioned by a stone masonry um, person. But I, I never thought about that we already had a white stone inside of the church. I, I never thought about that until the prayer meeting this week. Not the prayer meeting, the open rewards, but I'm talking about in the, in the closet prayer meeting where such was revealed that we have a white stone. So do we meet all three gift requirements? Do we meet the gift requirement of the hidden manna? Do we meet the gift requirement of the white stone? And do we meet the gift requirement of a name given that no man had ever heard? Uh, you know, or is anything disqualified? And I think, we've, as I said earlier, we've already gone over the outline. We have to discover whether or not that's hidden manna. But empirically, we have this white stone here. There's no doubting that. There's no, you may disagree with the name that's written on it. But then I would argue the writing of the name of Jesus does not disqualify any other name or any other written writings. Jesus, the name of Jesus is sufficient. So I wouldn't say that if, so we have the white stone, but the name written on this white stone does not fit the definition that's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. And I would, I would retort, if you write the name of Jesus, I think you're good to go. But we will we'll talk more about that. I can say this to you of, of, of surety, and this is revealed in prayer as well. As well. Those three gifts I just made mention of, and perhaps more, and the meaning thereof, if the world, or perhaps some of you, but certainly if the world and the powers that be believed that Allah was hidden matter, that this stone is the white stone spoken by the mouth of God to John the Revelator. And if Atla is a sound given that no man had heard till God spoke to me, if the world actually believes that, if the powers of the Supreme Court believe that, if the powers of the U.S. Congress, the House of Representatives, the senators, if the presidents and their administrations going back to Ronald Reagan, if they believe this, or Bill Clinton, I should say, if they believed Atla was hidden matter, or those at present today, the powers that be, the economics, the Jeff Bezos of the world, the Warren Buffets of the world, if they actually believe what was coming out of this house, that outlaw is hidden matter, and this is the white stone, they'd have me arrested. They'd have me arrested. Because that's what they do when such is introduced that they have no power or control over. See, the economics of our world are controlled by Wall Street. The politics are controlled by the politicians, be they as bent and crooked as they are. And they don't allow anything. They don't allow anything to enter into their space that they don't control. So when you see people like Franklin Graham or, or Joel Osteen, it doesn't matter how many people are packing to their auditoriums or their statements, they don't care because they're in control. But they would never, they would never let anything enter into the space of the economics or the politics or the spirituality or the social system of beliefs in America that they can't control. They will arrest you and stop you because they don't have the power and they are good at arresting. One of the things I can say about the Japheth man and Americans in general, they love their guns. They love guns. <laughs> you know, there are more than 392 million guns that are in circulation that are owned by Americans. You'll note also that there are less than 330 million persons in America, including children and babies just being born. So think about how many guns are out there. Americans love their guns. Of course, you know, they take them with them everywhere they go. Even when they go to space, they're taking their R-15 just in case. You never know. But I want you to think about something for just a second. And when you think about this ministry and you think about this, who we are, the government would never allow anything that they're not in control of, including religion. They, won't, they will not let you expand beyond their control. You don't start a church without the approval of the government. And you don't begin to announce there's a white stone or there's a word never heard by men nor angels till God spoke it 
here, they will not, if they believe that, they would arrest me. They put you in jail as well, if they believe that. I want to turn a corner for just a second, because I'm coming back to that, obviously, you know I will. Uh, there have been two Hamites, that is to say, black man or Negro or colored man or men, who have claimed quasi-deity, that is to say they've associated themselves at the level of, of messiahship or deity or, or God or son of God. And they were Hamites that have made this. They didn't just align themselves with prophecy such as what we're aligning ourselves in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. We're simply claiming prophecy. These men I'm going to announce in just a moment, they um, align themselves with deity. Um, and one of those men, his name was Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie was the emperor of uh, Ethiopia. And um, he is born of the bloodline of Solomon. It should be noted that if you look clearly at the face of Haile Selassie, that you should be able to see all the way back to Solomon and David by looking at this man. He claimed deity. His original Ethiopian father was a, a son of Solomon named Menelik. But Haile Selassie claimed deity and started a religion we know as the Rasta religion that is pre prevalent in the uh, Caribbean and to some degree here in America in a smaller way. But also there is the other deity a uh, Hamite man that claimed deity was a man by the name of um, Father Divine. And uh, Father Divine, of course, is, uh, he and Haile Selassie were contemporaries. And while I don't mean to be picking on anyone, they were both about the same stature in terms of the fact they were not very tall men. I think when Haile Selassie arrived in Kingston uh, at one point and got off the plane. The people were amazed that he was such a small man. But both of these men, without waver, declared deity. In fact, Father Divine said he was divine. Uh, so these are the two Hamite men. But the Hamite triangle that I want to complete here today uh, consists of including in these contemporaries uh, as we look at what has happened to those men and what will happen to us if the world begins to believe what we're preaching. Uh, the other person is Marcus Messiah Garvey. Marcus Garvey, of course, was the, uh, perhaps the younger lived of all of, of these men. Uh, again, born in Jamaica in the era of the, uh, of the, uh, the Rasta religion. And Marcus Garvey considered himself to be the, the president of all of Africa. And of course started the Black Star Line to take all Africans back to Africa after the slavery event here in America. And he founded a group called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And Marcus Garvey, obviously, if I can go back for just a moment, Father Divine stood in this very building. His spirit is still here. In this place that we're in right now was the headquarters of Father Divine's ministry here in New York. Now I had offices in Philadelphia as well. But he occupied this building for many years. He came, he slept in this same property that we're now enjoying as our religious space. Marcus Garvey on the other hand, the Lenox Avenue was his promenade of businesses. In fact, Bojangles, Marcus Garvey, Father Divine, Billy Holiday, all associated. They, they should have named, and, and I'm not against Malcolm in that regard. I think what he did to Elijah Muhammad regarding disclosing his personal business uh, was wrong. And no man should do that, should do that to another man, especially his leader. So I'm against him for that. Muhammad Ali was against him when he met him in Africa. Why did you do that to Elijah Muhammad? But this, this boulevard should have been named Billy Holiday Boulevard. That's what it should have been named. 
Because she's, she and Marcus Garvey made this strip, Lenox Avenue from 110 up to 147 49th Street, the avenue that it is. And the businesses, the cleaners, the restaurants, the stores that Marcus Garvey's followers owned on Lenox Avenue was absolutely incredible. And of course, his park is just here to my right, just a couple of steps out to the east of this door, and I'm in the Marcus Garvey Park. So these two men, Marcus Garvey and Father Divine, inhabited this space that, and perhaps Marcus Garvey was here in discussion with Father Divine. I don't know that to be fact. Uh, but I do know that they were contemporaries. And so I, I think it's important that we understand of these men, I'm saying that now with respect to a, an understanding about what is happening in this house, what is happening in this ministry, that this, these men form what I will refer to as the Hamite Triangle. And of course, they were all born in the 1800s, the latter part of the 1800s, I think Holly Selassie or was born in 1877 or 1887 or 90, and, 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 and uh, 92 rather. They were all contemporaries of one another. Um, so I, I would think that having understood that these men, two of them claimed deity, the other was a mighty entrepreneur and leader. That does not get a lot of respect. And because Marcus Garvey understood if he could get you people to unite the way Moses told the children of Israel to unite and harness your powers that you could own the world. And he bought several major ships from the English shipbuilder, the White Star Line, to take people back to Africa. And they arrested him. They arrested him because his plan was to move all of the diaspora slaves back to Africa and he had ships to take them on and there'd be no middle passage crisis. But when the government heard that they would lose a major workforce in America by all black people or Negroes or coloreds going back to Africa, and you'll have to remember that Marcus Garvey called himself at one point the, uh, the president of all of Africa, including Morocco and Algiers and Libya. He, he, called, he, he considered himself appointed by God to rule all of Africa. And when the powers that be discovered that Marcus Garvey had a plan and that the people were following him and were going to board those ships, they arrested him. They used someone within the organization uh, to, to spy on him and, uh, and to report things that perhaps should have been kept private and secret in the organization. And they alleged that he was a tax fraud cheat. And they arrested him. He wasn't. But sometimes when the government want to build a case against you, they can do what they want to do. They don't have to give you legal advice or legal justice. They built a case against him and they used one of his elders that was a part of his group, somebody they thought he trusted, that sold him out. And he went to jail and languished in jail. And when he came back, they stripped him of his US citizenship and shipped him back to Jamaica. He finally left Jamaica and traveled to London where he ultimately died at a very young age of 53 years of age. But my point about, and I want you to understand, that if they knew what was going on in this house or believed it, they'd arrest me. If they believed it, they don't believe. But Marcus Garvey was threatening to shut down the entire cheap workforce in America by sending Negroes, or at the, as they were called at that time, back to Africa. That would have ruined the American economy, would have set them back again in a, in a, during a time of the Great Depression that they just could not have stood for that to happen. So they arrested him and then they killed him. And, and I want you to understand if they believed that this was the white stone, that this is the stone that God spoke to John the Revelator, that this stone is in this house. They probably would arrest all of us. They certainly would arrest me. And they trump up charges or get people to testify against me. And possibly try to kill me. Because again, as I stated before, 
this government and no government, I don't care if you call this a democracy or Marxism or communist or whatever the hell you want to call it, no government allows any entity within its structure that it cannot control. Now they control all the religion, they control the Baptists. Now they are banking on, as a counter, that Black Lives Matter will control all you black people. It'll control your abortions, it'll control your sexual ideas, it'll control marriage. They're, bank they're banking on Black Lives Matter controlling your Negroes. And that's why they're giving them all the press and all the power, giving them international wherewithal so they can control y'all. So that you won't get out of hand. They keep you poor. But if they knew what was happening here, I wanna wonder, wonder I'm coming, I wanna come back to that, obviously. I wanna turn another corner or come back to try to raise the question, is this that white stone? I mean, if you can think for just a second, and I don't know how, and if, if you have misgivings or if you have doubts or questions as to whether or not this was stone without my knowing it, that Jesus spoke this white stone 2,000 years ago and it's in our midst, we're in possession of it? You may have misgivings, and I would, not, I would not doubt you. I would not be able to argue with you if you did. Because sure, certainly I can understand. And we've just gone ahead now and accepted Atwa. We've changed the name of the, the city. And some people actually believe that. But were we to be accurate about this, we might want to try to do, and what I'd like to be able to do, is to see if there's any further way we can validate. Is this that white stone? I'll tell you what, it is beautiful, I'll have to tell you that. It's just a beautiful lectern, it's just, I, just, I just love it. Um, and I've had some great moments standing behind this beautiful white stone. You can't begin to imagine what my life has been like. And we've, of course, a large segment of it is covered by the prayer box, but that's good, that's okay. But how do we validate those three gifts, the white stone, the hidden manna, or the word spoken no man had ever heard before. How do we validate that? Uh, one is, is that we have to then look, what they taught me in seminary over yonder was you didn't have to examine the text because it's out of this text that these thoughts originate. It's out of uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation in totality, but verse 17, uh, specifically that the whole idea about hidden manna or white stone or word never heard before until the person who heard it heard it, uh, th those ideas originate. Without verse 17 as it now stands, we would have no context or no way of understanding or even having an imagination that someone would eat hidden manna. We probably would never think along those lines. There's nothing that calls us to prompt us to think about hidden manna until it's introduced by Jesus. Moreover, we wouldn't think about a white stone and a name or a name, a word spoken that no man had heard. And by the way, the synopsis of, 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 uh, of both the hidden manna and the word spoken, both of these are post-creation entities. That is to say that the word atla was not a sound of the original sounds that were in the earth. When the word outlaw was spoken, it had never been heard by men nor by angels until God spoke it to me. So when I say it, it's a sound. While I talk about manna, does not meet the elements chart, uh, if you will, composition. Outlaw does not meet the regular sound barrier sounds. It, uh, and I would wonder whether we had some real great scientists or engineers like Arnold LaFleur who would measure whether or not the sound outlaw travels at the same sound of 1,100 feet per second. That is the speed of sound. And anything beyond that breaks the sound barrier. But when outlaw, does it travel at the same sound speed that all other sounds travel, or is it a different sound? Because it does not fit into the universe of sounds that were heard on planet Earth till God spoke it to me. But how do we validate that? I mean, so one of the things we have to do is go back to the text. That's what they told me over in seminary. Go back to the text and look at the text and examine it. And they have a thing they call it to, to exegete the text. That's a way of studying. And exegete, exegeting is a, the word that brings into play the tools that you use to unearth the text, to, to look at it, to critique it. It's what you do. And often 
the times that you'll discover as well, and not just whether you're in seminary or whether you're doing an exegetical process, that the text itself or the Bible itself will volunteer information. You don't have to go looking for it. It'll just spring right out at you, the text itself. And, but if it doesn't volunteer information, if it locks that information, if it's there, if it's hidden information, that you need to research the time, that you need to use, use historical criticism. That is to say, you need to go back to the history of that time and understand the tenor of the words that were used or the climate that was imposed or whatever else that historically impacts what took place on the Isle of Patmos. Or you can use literary criticism. What was the writing style? Patmos was an island off the coast of Greece by some 100 miles or so. How did he get out there in the first place? Why was he out there? And what was the language style? And what was the structure? Why would he use the kind of words that he used in order to be able to discover well, was white stone really the meaning of white stone? Was it white or was it opaque or was it marble or what was it? By the way, Greece is the place where some of the best marble in the world is found. Study it, look it up. Greece has some of the best, they call it blue marble, some of the most, the most beautiful, durable marble on the planet. And that's just west of, and Patmos is just west of where the white stone writing took place. But I wanna ask some questions, and I promise not to be very long here with the asking of the questions, but what I wanna do is that I understand I have to tell you that it is, it is generally beyond, when I first heard the word outlaw, I didn't like it. I, everybody knows that. But I persisted. And then finally the Lord did an exegetical process with me. He took me to the Bible. And the way the Lord got me to begin to have uh, some sort of relationship and confidence about the word outlaw was that he took me to the Bible to do what I'm gonna do with you right now. He took me to the Bible, took me to Genesis chapter two, verse 11, where it talks about the river Pison and the first known city outside of the Garden of Eden, a city called Havilah. And the city of Havilah, uh, God showed me that the name of that city, and it was a city, the last three letters of the name of that city ended in LAH. And then he pointed out to me, that Atla ends in L-A-H. But he didn't stop there, because he had to convince me. Because I didn't like the name. I, I mean, I, I, would, I didn't hate it, but I didn't understand it. So then he took me, he marched me through the Bible with nearly every name of power in the Bible ending in A-H. For instance, Jeremiah, or Deborah, or Noah, or Isaiah, or Zechariah, or Jehovah, or Hallelujah, or Messiah, and on and on and on and on and on the words go. And nearly every name, looks like the Jews couldn't name their children anything other than A-H ending names. And then after that exercise of recognizing how many names, including Messiah, ends in the English alphabet of A-H, I fell in love with Allah. Because then, I said, then it was confirmed that it was biblical. Then it confirmed of its root within the word of God. And I'm immovable now. I'm immovable now. Because, and by the way, if you look at Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4, Canaan land itself was once called Beulah land. And the old church, remember, if you've been around the church for as long as I've been, you remember we used to call Canaan land Beulah land. And uh, it's an old Negro hymn going to Beulah land. And Beulah is a beautiful old Negro name because it's the name of the land rather than Canaan or Israel before the Palestinians or the Jews. It's called Beulah land. And Beulah ends in L-A-H. And so, thank you, Mr. Engineer. Where is it? Is it there? Yeah. The, that shall be called, uh, be more and more called, more and more term, no more term, forsaken, neither shall the land be termed uh, desolate, but thou shalt be called Ipsabah. And again, that's the A-H ending. And the land, Beulah. And Beulah ends in L-A-H. Atla ends in L-A-H. I'm convinced. But the world isn't. And I'm not sure that you are. But I'm convinced that it's from God. I'm convinced that it had never, when I say Atla, I say something that even the angels were not privileged to God shared it with me. When I share it with you, when we share Atla, we are sharing something that even the angels we're not privileged to. God so loved us so much 
that he gave it to us to see what we will do with it. And it's the new name that is given for the community known as Harlem. I want to quickly do the same thing, if you will, or well, not quite as similar with this Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, uh, in looking at the book of Revelation um, and to try to discover, is this, the, is this the white stone? And are we collectively the essence of that ancient prophecy? We, Akbar, we, Mother One, we people here, that we are the essence. We are what God saw 1900 years ago. He spoke us into existence. He spoke out loud. He spoke this stone. Is that true? Is it true? Is it true that God spoke us? He knew us before we knew ourselves. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. He knew us and spoke us. And we are the essence and the standard bearer of carrying out the prophecy of the Lord God Almighty given 1900 years ago. Is that true? Is it true? Is it true we're not crazy? Is it true we're not a hate church? Is it true that we preach righteousness? Is it true that the rest of the world is going on their way to hell and serving the devil? And we have been chosen by God to eat of the hidden manna and to bear the white stone. You'll have to decide. But I, I think that if we begin to look at it, then how do we respond? I know I have to ask myself, how do I respond to such an, a magnanimous power drop that God has dropped on Harlem? How do, how do, we, resp how do we respond to that? I know that it's not been... It's not been easy for you, because it certainly hasn't been easy for me uh, to carry Allah. We're hated by the world. They walk by here every day. And they purpose to destroy us, not knowing why. But the main reason why they want to destroy us is that we do not conform to them, and we are well assured that we don't need to conform to them. We are well informed, we are well assured that we, that me as the pastor and preacher of Atla, no president that has ever served America has ever served at the level I serve humanity and serve God. And I know it. Therefore, I don't bow. So how do we, how do we make that adjustment? How do we, how do we believe it? And so I want to quickly run through some things it will help us maybe to learn how to adjust our lives. Now, remind me to tell you what to do, how to, how to live your life, how to adjust your life. This is that white stone. If we have in our presence a, a, this lectern that was formed by the mouth of God, it wasn't just my imagination, that this was formed by the mouth of God 1900 years ago, and it stands as clear reality. One of the things I want to do, go back to the, the, the Hamite Triangle. Father Divine was in this building. What you may think about it, you may think whatever it is, you can, you can judge him any way you want. But he was in this building. Marcus Garvey, perchance, was in this building. John D. Rockefeller, perchance, was in this building. J.P. Morgan, perchance, was in this building when it was the men's club. This building has a rich history, perhaps the richest history of properties in Harlem, more so than the Abyssinian Church or some other museum or library of the people that inhabited this building. And now it's ours. That much is empirical. That much is clear. That much is undeniable. We're in it now. We're in it now. You can't argue against that. You can't say that's not true. So what do we do next? How do we move forward? And how do we adjust ourselves that we might continue to please Almighty God. Obviously, we've pleased him up to this point. Otherwise, he would not be releasing the information about the celebration of this white stone. I'm right. I'm the Lord's servant. There ain't no doubt about it. People can call me whatever the hell they want to call me. They can say I hate the black man all the hell they want. They're liars. I'm perhaps the only man that loves him. Other than Marcus Garvey. 
who's no longer able to love him, or Father Divine, or Holly Selassie. And perhaps I'm the only man that loves the black man. With a love that's from God has nothing to do with politics or self-advancement. It's a pure love. And it's so pure that the blind man can't see it. It goes past his understanding and he calls it hate because it's wrapped up in truth. I tell him the truth because I love him. I wouldn't lie to him. He's my brother. And I'm the Lord's servant. I don't lie to my brother. I tell him about himself. And so, how do we move forward? First, you know, we've dated the prophecy. We discovered that it was 1900 years ago. And how many of the chapters of the book of Revelation have prophecy themselves that are akin to or different from the prophecy of Revelation 2.17? And just quickly in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, there's a prophecy there that's, that's similar to the prophecy. Now, there are going to be eight prophecies all total of the three gifts that we've made mention of throughout the scriptures. But in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, there are eight prophecies. Prophecy number one is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, and I will give to him to eat of the tree of, uh, of life. You see that? That's, pro now that's, that's a prophecy that Jesus is given through John. That's one prophecy. So the process of eating of a tree, they didn't say manna, but it said the tree of life. And those are distinct, by the way. Those two are not the same. But the idea, the prophetic ideal is consistent with giving man something to eat. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel chapter four, quoting Moses and, and John in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse four, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the process of eating is God's process of giving man his word. So he given to eat. That's verse seven. The next prophecy, and I've scanned this book carefully, the next prophecy given is in Revelation chapter two, verse 10. And it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. And that's what he would do. If, if Joe Biden or Vladimir Putin or Angela Merkel or any of those people in world government knew what was happening in this house as true, they put me in prison. That's what they would do. Again, don't be deceived by church organizations, Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, or anything else. No government in no nation, whether you're communist or democratic or capitalist, no government will allow any institution to exist in its nation without it having control over it. These preachers are controlled by the government. But this house is not. Be clear. And if they find out what you're doing, they will put you in prison the way they did Marcus Garvey. Fear none of those things which they shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That was prophesied. That you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thy faithful unto death. And I will give thee the crown of life. So that totality is a segment of of prophecy number two. That's true. You've seen them put people who they don't have control of in prison. If the media can't control you, if money can't control you, they put you in prison. That's just what they do to you. So that prophecy, and Jesus is the devil that does it. The third prophecy, of course, comes as our prophecy in the prophets given in these, in these writings. Chapter 2, verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. So the first two prophecies that we've examined in Revelation chapter 2, that 
it, uh, to eat of the tree of life, we know that that tree existed in creation. That, and then there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that existed in Genesis creation. We know that. And to him that overcometh the world, God will give you the uh, opportunity to eat of that tree. He also says, but be aware that you are controlled by the government, by the powers. Of, well, actually, you're controlled by Satan. He runs these government. Satan runs both Biden, Obama, Camelback, ain't black Harris. He runs Trump. He runs Mitch McConnell. He owns all of them. And anybody who thinks anything different has not had a clear thought. He owns all of them. He owns Putin. He owns the kingdoms of this world. Every last one. He owns Jay-Z. Hell, he owns the rappers. He owns Black Lives Matter. He owns all of them. They all work for him. All of them. All of them. All of them. You're not going to raise up in this world, in Satan's kingdom, and start something that can overthrow him. You, that ain't going to happen. No, you are not. You run around here talking about you want to be a part of these groups or, or that somehow an old bomb has been sent for you. He, he's been sent by Satan. He's Satan's son, damn it! I told you. Don't let nobody become president who can change, who can actually change people's lives. You done lost your mind. <laughs> you actually think somebody's going to become president that's going to do something to help you? <laughs> I know you crazy. You think some church, whether it's Franklin Graham or Joel Osteen or any of them, going to start an organization to actually bring you to Jesus? You think that's what they're there to do? You think Franklin Graham purpose is to bring you to Jesus? They're going to put you in jail if they find out that's what you're doing. They put Jesus in jail. They put John in jail. They'll put you in jail if they can't control you. At any rate, so prophecy number four is in Revelation chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. And behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children. Now this is the loving Jesus. He says, I'll kill children. Well, you won't hear that in the Baptist church. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> you won't hear that in the Presbyterian church. Jesus kills children of parents who are vile. That's right. He does. He says, except they repent. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the rings of, and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. It's another prophecy. Uh, moving along to prophecy number five, is found in verse 26. To him that overcometh, and keeping my works unto the end, to him will I give the power over the nations. Atla can be the most powerful entity on planet Earth of all nations. Moses said to the children of Israel when they had nothing but pots and pans, they didn't have a good knife to fight with. They didn't have any bowls or arrows, they didn't have any horses, they didn't have a good cooking knife. All they had there were pots and pans, then kneading troughs and a bunch of children hanging on behind them. And Moses said to that ragtag group there at Kadesh Barnea, he said to Mount Pisgah, he said to God will make you above only and not beneath. You'll be the head of all nations if you just keep my word. Don't worry about how many people they got in their battles or how tall or walled up their cities are. It is God that will fight for you. You take the word. The word of God will fight for you. And we can do the same thing. This word will fight. You don't have to worry about the communists, the capitalists, or anybody else. This word, if we keep this word, that's why I preach it. 
we keep this word, no nation, no man can stand before. We'll be the head of all nations. And our law will be the nation that will dominate planet Earth. All we got to do is keep the word of God, keep God's word. That's all we have to do. And no man will ever stand before you. That's verse 26. Um, and verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and with vessels. And of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. You know, I've heard people say to me, I ought to be more loving. Pastor Manning is too harsh. You know, he, 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 he needs to be more loving. And on and on. You know I don't pay no attention to that. I know that's the devil. I spare people, maybe I shouldn't. I spare people the embarrassment of saying to them, get behind me, devil. Tell me I should be more loving. I rule with a rod of iron. That's why weak men won't come in this church. Only a strong man will follow me. When you hear men discussing me or criticizing me or talking about me, it's because they're weak. Because I rule and I rule with a rod of iron. I'm a leader. I'm nobody's sissy. I'm nobody's boy. And men that are weak, little boys, pissy, sissy, little girls, they can't pee straight. If you put them in front of the bathtub in the bathroom and tell them to take out their penis and pee, they'll miss the whole thing. They're weak men. They won't come to this church. And they do everything to try to keep you from coming. Try to get you out of here. Because they're weak. Because they can't stand the kind of leadership that I expect of men. And that Jesus expects of men. Verse uh, item number six. Um, um, verse 28 of, 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 of prophecy number five. And I will give to him the morning star. Praise almighty God. That's the eastern star. That's the morning star. That's the, the brightness. That's another prophecy. We'll, we'll do more with that. Item number six of Revelation chapter three, verse four and five. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. That's another prophecy. And... So we're now trying to see the consistency of the prophecy to see how do they, how do they find any kind of continuity with Revelation chapter 2 regarding the white stone, what God will do. What he's doing, he's giving out a lot of stuff. He's giving the morning star, he's giving the eat of the tree of life, he's giving white robes, he's giving a white stone to people that are able to meet his requirements understanding and be clear be clear that this is not this earth does not is not God's kingdom nothing on this earth in terms of his kingdoms or governments none of it belongs to God none of it if he has any place now that belongs to him is Atla he tried desperately to get Israel to build a little kingdom a small nation Israel wasn't very much but he tried to carve out for himself a group of people that would serve him he gave them their own laws, their own constitution, their prophets. He gave them their own money. He gave them their own way of doing life. And yet they walked away from it. He said, now if you do this, you'll survive. All the nations around you, you'll survive. But if you don't, you'll be weak and they'll overcome you. If he has a nation now, it's Atla. But America doesn't belong to him. Talk all that talk you want. None of these nations belong to him. But he says that he did overcome it, the world. I will give these precious things. And verse 21 of Revelation chapter 3 is his final prophecy. Again, I'll give him to overcome. Uh, who that overcomes, I'll give him a throne. Um, the prophecy given in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is my anchor. And it's a beautiful prophecy. By the way, we've completed Deuteronomy this week, praise God. But it's my anchor. We don't have to beg anybody anything. 
Um, we can be the head and not the tail. Don't, don't, don't let nobody tell you that we got to have the government or we got to have, we got to compromise as they wanted me to do with no do no rain. Or wanted me to bow down to Obama. No, we don't have to compromise. And I'm not going to compromise. I'm not. I'm the Lord's servant. I ain't serving nobody else. I don't have to. I'm the Lord's servant. I know it. That much I know. Whether this is the white stone or not, I, one thing I know, I know I'm God's servant. I know that. I know that I'm his boy. I know that. Everybody else can go to hell. I'm the Lord's servant. I know it. Do what you want. Talk that talk all you like. No, I'm the Lord's servant. I, I, I want to turn one more corner, and I promise not to turn any more corners, <laughs> if I can possibly not be consistent. You may have heard there have been recent sightings of flying unidentified objects over the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean of late. Uh, these objects that have been spotted by Navy pilots, I think it is, uh, in their aircraft have noticed these objects that are flying that do not conform to the usual uh, acts of gravity or to the various forces such as centrifugal force uh, in terms of how they how they maneuver, they, the maneuvers that these allegedly, these, air, these Navy pilots have been saying about these unidentified flying objects is completely different from anything we've seen on Earth or that we understand out of our understanding of physics. And they've made these reports. The other thing is that they've said these objects were seen a couple of hundred years ago, but they've just decided to release this information in terms of some sort of an examination um, as unidentified objects. The, uh, and those of you who follow such things, and you don't have to, it's not necessary, but there was allegedly a crash in 1947 by an object that came from, allegedly from outer space, in a place called Roswell, New Mexico. And the, uh, the crash that took place was kept secret by the government, and there's hangar number seven, someplace in Indiana, St. Louis, where they gathered the pieces of this craft that allegedly crashed in 1947 that's been kept under absolute top secret uh, commands in this warehouse, a hangar, since 1947. And then there's one other thing with respect to um, understanding the dynamics of things such as manna, or words never spoken, or creations, or things that defy the physics, or elements of where we are at present. You may have heard as well over the years that there's a segment of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Carolina and mid-Florida uh, going west called the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. And in this so-called triangle, geographically over the Atlantic Ocean, up as far as North Carolina down, as far uh, as Florida and as far west as Bermuda, that ships that have gone into that have never been seen again. They've never come out of that triangle. A number of reports that uh, military air force that's been documented that an entire squadron of planes flew into the Bermuda Triangle some years ago, and they've never been heard of since. And they've never been found, and even with modern technology, to discover whether they were, uh, on, they just sank into the ocean, they've not been able to found, find any fragments or, of the planes themselves. They just disappeared. Ships have disappeared. And the reason why I raise that as an issue uh, in terms of anomalies of things that perhaps we don't completely understand or that even science itself is grappling with and trying to be able to appreciate, not so much to try to explain the Bermuda Triangle, but the fact that they named it a triangle uh, interests me. As you know, the triangle is the one thing that man does make, that, he, that God does not make anything on a right angle or triangle. So if this is a place where you go into and you never come out again, ever what calls it, and I'm not here to explain that now, but the fact that it's called a triangle interests me, that it would take that dimensions. Geographically, they would call it a triangle. And remember, going back to our early teachings in the Sabbath, where we talked about the triangle, the tent, the boat, the ark, um, and the power of the triangle, and the four square triangle of the pyramids themselves. They're simply four triangles put together in one space that make four square, but they're all triangles that actually meet at the top and are similar at the base. The fact that it calls this a triangle, not a circle, of this place where things disappear, I find fascinating. I do plan to speak more about that, but not now. 
And the reason why I find that interesting is because I believe that when Jesus does return, he's coming back to 123rd Street. I believe when he does come back, he's coming back here. I believe when he comes back, he's coming right here to 123rd. I believe he's coming to Harlem. I, in fact, I'm convinced that he would. And it was my study of the Bible, I've been doing this, I've been studying God's word for 40 years. I've studied the prophets. I've studied the uniqueness of Ezekiel's travels from back in time, from Babylon back into Jerusalem. And the time way of the wheel within a wheel, we actually, he traveled back in time. I've, I'm convinced that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back here. And again, if the government believed that, they try to stop him. They try to find a way to stop him. And oftentimes government put out propaganda about things they've seen that they haven't seen. They're lying, they could be. It could not be a flying unidentified object. It could be a lying unidentified object. I, I'm not making that determination. I'm just telling you about the government that we serve and the fact that most of these preachers Finally, I, you know, it would be wonderful. We have the power. We have the power to make Harlem Little Egypt. And that's probably a wrong, a, 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 not the best way to describe it, calling it Little Egypt. Because there was a song many years ago about a woman named Little Egypt. I don't know if y'all remember her. <laughs> but we can turn Harlem into an old aces like the world has never seen. The prophecy of banking that God gives in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if we employ that on a national scale, will give us global power. And it can be achieved that we can rule the world. They killed Marcus Garvey because he had the power to shut down. Think about it this way. They brought slaves from Mali and Timbuktu and Ghana to build America. And Marcus said, I'm taking them all back to Africa. America would have collapsed like a pancake without this labor force. It was not able to sustain itself. They killed Marcus Garvey because of what he preached and what he believed. It was a powerful man. We can do something similar if they don't kill me. And I'm praying that they don't. We can achieve through unity by having one banking system, just one bank. Um, we can complete what Haile Selassie in Ethiopia and Marcus Garvey here in Harlem and Father Divine. And by the way, you know, I've been to Ethiopia. I've been to Haile Selassie's palace. I was baptized in the Nile River. You do know that. I've been to Georgia, the home of, uh, of, these, um, of, of, of Marcus Garvey, I mean, uh, of, of Father Divine. And I've been to Jamaica. I've been to Jamaica, man. Kingston, Ocho Rios, Montego Bay. Beautiful, beautiful Montego Bay. I've been there when I was just a boy. I was in my 20s. But I've been to the homes of all of these men. And we can complete what they started. We can bring the unity of the banking system. We can bring all Hamites to bank in one system. You see, all the money that's taken up in the church is not here in Harlem because there are very few. Y'all put it in these banks. And I don't say quite pejoratively, or racially or with hate. I just say it because they're white banks. They belong white people. And you put your money there, whether it's your weekly check and you dispense bill payments. But you get 40, 50 million people all putting money in these banks. That's a lot of money every week. They take that money, turn around and make loans to other people to buy property. I had a piece I wanted to bring from a preacher that said that himself, but they won't let, he got the, that thing is so powerful, they've copyrighted it, but it's true. The money that they used to buy the Second Kingdom Baptist Church was the Second Kingdom Baptist Church people's money. <laughs> Second Kingdom put their money in Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, 
And then they take the money out of the bank and give it to the white man to buy second kingdom. <laughs> Put that on it. What damn fools these people are. Same thing with Legree or any of these other churches. Were you to extract all the deposits made by Hamite people from the banks, it would collapse most of this bank system. They couldn't stand it. They need that money coming in to make loans. They need that money to pay off their debt to the federal government. Where that money to stop coming in en masse across America, or just here in Harlem. You know, I, I wondered, uh, Esther Bennett, years ago, why I got all these banks? You know, they got a Wells Fargo bank right up here, a branch. Then they got one right down there on 16th Street. Then they got some other kind of bank across the street from Wells Fargo. Then they got Coffin Federal Savings. Then they got Chase over here, Chase over here, Chase over there, got Capital One. If this is so poor a community, why they got all these banks? Because that's where y'all put y'all money. And they could use more banks. Sometimes you go to the line, go to the bank at Wells Fargo down here, the line is out the door. Are y'all trying to get in it again to give the people your money? You're trying to give them your money. You got to wait online to give them your money. They don't even call you in and give you a cup of coffee. They just take your money. And we can stop that. We can stop that instantly. But it takes unity. It takes what Moses taught in Deuteronomy. And one of the things that we have to be united about, that I would say, is that we have to realize that lesbian and gay white people, not pejoratively, I could say J5, it probably sounds softer, but lesbians and gay white men and women have come up here, use your money to buy a $3 million condo and they move into it on $3 million and waiting on you to bring the money to the bank. It don't cost them really no skin off their nose. They're living in a house that you bought for them. Because <laughs> you're Negroes. Because you're Obama people. Yeah? They're living. You go out and buy a car, right? Buy used cars. Or... You go out and buy a car, right? You know, today you can buy a car, $50,000, let's say. You don't have to put any money down. The dealer don't want any money. The bank will finance it. You get in and drive off the lot. They ain't play, lay it out a penny. Maybe you pay for the license. You're driving a $50,000 car and ain't paid one penny. You will pay for it over a period of years. Right? And the banks are waiting for you to bring that money every week to put a little interest charge on it. Okay. You can buy a $3 million house and living in a $3 million house that you didn't have $3 million. But the money that you got to borrow it to pay the owner of the house, you got it from the black churches and the black businesses or the black people that work for the MTA or whoever else they work for who put the money in the bank and the white folk gave the money to you and you bought the house and you live in that house that you don't use. <laughs> and they just sitting here and happy as they can be. Obama, we're our first black president. Ooh, 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 ooh. Our first black president, Obama. Wall Street went on a tap in terms of rising out of the doldrums and out of the ashes, the profits on Wall Street, there were more than 400 billionaires under Obama's eight years of administration. We're talking about prior to Obama, there weren't even 40 billionaires with Warren Buffett, John D. Rockefeller, who, but Obama's promoting of Wall Street produced the largest amount of billionaires America has ever seen. And when Trump came to office, the market kept rising. And Trump kept saying he's the reason. No, he wasn't. Obama started that market to incline. It started rising under Obama. And it's rising right now because of Obama. And the rich are getting richer and not paying any taxes. And yet you're paying taxes, talking about you got a first black president. I've never seen anything like it living in a rented space, giving your money to be given to lesbians and gays who came up here and took your community with your money. Al Sharpton took $800,000 and he pledged to the Jewish bankers he will never lead a march against gentrification. Everything else, but gentrification, Al is good to go. In fact, Al don't even live here. So, Recently, what we're going to have to do and what Princess Williams will tell you, what I'm fighting against, 
I'm fighting against the LGBTQ. They're the ones who fear me most. That vile group of people, they own this community. They own everything that goes, they own the churches, they own the pastors, they own the politicians. They don't own me. You've seen them march against me. You've seen the newspaper articles they've written against me. You've seen how they shut me out. You've seen it. And that's where my, my battle, not yours personally, because many of y'all agree with them. But my battle is with them, and their battle is with me. And Princess Lewis will tell you, but not just them, and then they've incorporated and glorified Black Lives Matter with three lesbians at the head of an international organization allegedly for the uplift of black people, no men included. All lesbos, all freaks. And that's where all the money and all the, pri all the media attention is going. And that's the battle that we're fighting. Now we can win it. I'm not lamenting, I'm not saying we can't win it. We can win it. But the problem is if you're gonna get an international bank, and I'll tell you how that can be done, you gotta first convince Hamite people, that's black people, they need to make a decision, damn it. You need to make a decision as to whether or not you're gonna support gay, lesbian, transgenders, queers, and what they consider as to be their rights. And you stand with them over against helping the poor, the needy, and the homeless, and the unemployed. You got to make your decision. If you fight against this proposal of banking because its purpose is to rid Harlem of its white and gay status and turn it back righteous and straight again, if that's who you're going to support the gays over against the poor and the homeless, well, get the hell out of here. You're going to support you got poor, go out there on the street, see all these homeless people, sick, broken. And you're going to stick up for some lesbian who says, I want to be me. Or some transgender boy that cut off his testicles and says he wants to. And you're going to support that rather than poor people, the homeless and the needy and those who God loves. Got to make up your damn mind. Got to make up. You see what? You see what you think? You see what I look at when I look at these people on television, these Dan Jones, these Cornell West, these Black Lives Matter? What the hell are you talking about supporting these people? Obama. <laughs> He's the one. He's the one that made it possible. So you say, you, well, I am not going. I think the gays have a right to be up here. <laughs> here. The, um, we can do a couple of things. The unity of power in banking. We get the message out. Like Marcus Garvey. All money, Hamites from Los Angeles all the way to Bangor, Maine, and everywhere and in between. Every one of your deposits goes into one bank, one institution. Now it's going to take some work. It's going to take me a year or so to work this out. But as the Democrats can't exist without the black vote. If the black vote stopped voting for Democrats, they'll never win another office in, in history. They need the black vote. But they also need that black dollar, as, as, as minor as it is, the banks do. You know, in terms of working all this out, I think one of the nations in Africa, and I'm not necessarily leaning in that direction, I just want to explore and I want to be clear, is that one of the nations in Africa, the strongest banking and insurance industry is the nation of Nigeria. And ironically, this week I got a call from uh, Elder LaFleur's uh, father-in-law, now in Georgia. He has uh, three daughters and a bunch of beautiful grandchildren in this church. He's from Nigeria. But Nigeria has a strong banking system. It has a strong oil industry. And there's a Nigerian called Aliko 
than get than gete than gote than aliko aliko than gote, and he's allegedly the richest man in Africa. He uh, he's alleged by Forbes magazine. Well, alleged. He's, Forbes magazine declares he has some eleven billion dollars, and he's an entrepreneur, businessman, and in engineering and agricultural. And uh, do we have him, Mr. Engineer? Then go take. Um, eleven billion dollars in Nigeria. Uh, you remember several years ago that uh, the police chief of the Nigerian Lagos Nigerian police force was caught at London Heathrow Airport with $10 million in a suitcase, trying to get through customs. Nigeria does have resources. And Harlem has resources as well. Um, I don't know whether Dan Gote will talk to me. But if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. I was simply offering something to him, not him offering anything to me. But the one thing that inspires me about Dan Gote is that he has built his empire on health, medical institutions in Africa, and education institutions in Africa. Now he's profited from it, no doubt, he's made money from it, but also he's reached out and he's plowed through the regular things that defeat businesses and he's been a success, but he's into education, into health. And, and Africa needs a lot of those kinds of institutions. Imagine all the money in America from the diaspora, Hamites, flowing into one bank into Nigeria. And a process of which could be set up by entrepreneurs, business people. And you could be given a bank card where you've given one from Chase and you can pay your bills online. Or you can tap and pay. They got things right now where you can, if your bank balance gets low, they'll send you a notice. So you really don't have to go to a bank anymore. You see people standing in line now in banks. It's, they haven't updated themselves. The banking system is out of, this, out of sight. And if Dan Gote, if the Nigerian bankers are not interested in such, my purpose would be if we poured that kind of money into a Nigerian banking system, imagine all the schools and hospitals that could be built by the money that we're putting into the banks that we're not necessarily using. Loans could be made to build hospitals, to educate, to build schools, to build housing out of our money rather than putting it in Chase Bank or Wells Fargo and the money going to buy lesbians and gays houses here in the community or to, uh, to finance these $150,000 restaurants that you see all up and down the avenues. They borrow the money from you, from the church. The banks give, you put it in the bank, the banks give it to them. We could do that. And I'm not necessarily want to do it in Nigeria. I don't, don't think I'm somehow another racist in that regard. I just thought I would mention Dan Gote. I thought I would mention to you the potential. We can do it with Japan. Hell, we can do it with Sumitono Bank. We can do it with Barclays Bank. It's an English bank. We can do it with any bank who would not have a problem with the fact that our goal is to turn Harlem righteous and straight again. We're not going to let Harlem be turned. We're not going to let Joe Lewis and... Uh, Jackie Robinson and Will Smalls, Paradise, and Will Chamberlain, all these great leaders that were in Harlem and all these preachers, we're not going to let these lesbians and gays come up here and just crush this community, destroy what these men built, and turn Harlem white and gay. We're not going to do that. It don't make no damn sense. It don't make no sense. I mean, what's wrong with y'all? What's wrong with you? All the hard work they were done by these men. You know, they used to have a Freedom National Bank. We had our account there. But y'all stop putting your money there. Carver is owned by, I think Chase owns Carver. It's just a little old thing, it ain't much, nothing, but it gives y'all a little something, something. But Freedom Bank collapsed because of poor management. And it's just difficult to get y'all to unite together because y'all don't want to do that. Y'all are running around talking about electing a black politician. Listen, let the white people have the politician. We'll just take the money and the land. We'll take the authority. I, you don't need to be in office. Money talks. Didn't somebody tell you that? You don't have to be no politician. You don't have to be no mayor. Do you know if Bill, if, if Jeff Bezos calls 
uh, Bill de Blasio, I don't care if he's having sex with his wife. He said, wait a minute, honey. That's Jeff Bezos now. Baby, you go, I got, I'm, he gonna stop everything he can talk to. Why? Because Bezos got money. Money talks. Not to be no black president. No black president. You don't need no black president. Y'all take that. Y'all want that. Y'all want to be politicians. Go to hell on. We got the money. We got the power. We call the shots. Now say a word like that will get me killed. <laughs> you know, Harlem has become uh, the homeless capital of humanity. It, it is very sad when you look at what you people have allowed to take place. <laughs> I swear. It, it just don't make no sense. That all this poverty still reigns. Look at that. This is Harlem after Dr. King and Obama. Look at that. Oh hey, man got and a woman on the street like that. Come on now. Come on. Come on. That Dr. King marched, and that's what we got. Can I show you what Harlem looked like before Dr. King and before Obama? Can I give you a little bit of a glimpse of what it looked like during the days of Marcus Garvey? Let me show you Marcus Garvey and Father Divine's Harlem. Mr. Engineer, that's Marcus Garvey's Harlem. That's Father Divine. See that? Look at that. That's Princess Lewis's father with that hat on over there walking across the street. Look at these men. This is Marcus Garvey. These are Marcus Garvey. This is the, uh, the men of, of uh, Father Divine. Right across the street over here. Right across the street over here. And now you're talking about Obama? Look at what the hell you have become since Obama! Our first black president. Uh, it, it, it don't make no sense. It, at any rate, the question is, and y'all stand up for this, is this, is this the white stone? Is it? Is Atla the hidden manna? It's no accident that we're in this church. Diara, who's graduating this week, I think she'll send us a link then going on to higher education. Make note of when I sit over here sometimes, I let my feet dance the way Father Divine's feet would dance. He's quite a dancer, Father Divine. It's no accident that we're in this building. It's no accident. This is, this is we just happen to end up here. And then I end up with a message like this. Well, that Marcus Garvey Park is just over there. It's no accident. No accident. This is this is God, and this is no accident that this is not some sort of wooden lectern that we're preaching from. We're all Baptist church and Pentecostal, and everybody else preach from. No, this is different. This is different, and so we have to then come to terms with that. We have to come to terms. Whatever you may think about Haile Selassie. Again, you can look in his face if you want to see what if you want to know what David looked like. Look at Haile Selassie. You want to know what Solomon looked like? There is King David. There he is. The Ethiopian emperor, born of Queen Sheba and Solomon. And Marcus Garvey, in his military outfit, in his convertible automobile. This is what men used to look like. That's the kind of man that the government will not let live. They will not let you have that kind of control. They won't do it. Now, they'll let you be president. You want to be black president? Oh, they let Kamala Harris be black. She ain't, first of all, she ain't black. That's the first thing. But you want to be president? Okay, just stay away from the money. Just don't teach the people. Don't you wake the people up. Don't you let the people know. We'll let you be president, but you dance style music. The same thing with... Uh, Marcus Garvey and Father Divine, they all, Father Divine had to leave town. And he finally, he left this building and he ended up in outside of Philadelphia, in a beautiful compound out there. I'm gonna go out there and see if we can buy it. I don't know if y'all ever seen it, but look at the documentary of Father Divine. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful place. It's rolling hills, it's a big castle, it's uh, and he had just a few, of his followers are still out there now. 
I'm going to go out there shortly. It'll take some time to implement just banking. Just banking. Of course, and it may never happen, and I'm not doubting, but the problem will be is that I would never let anybody into an inter enterprise like this who does not keep the Sabbath and who does not tithe. You can be black, but that ain't the admission ticket. The admission ticket is Sabbath keeping and keeping the tithe. And then we have to go through a whole process of restructuring all the hate and lies that have been told about me. All that, that I'm a bad fella. I'm the truth teller. Men need to look up and see they don't have any balls. They're weak, especially African men, especially them. They'll sell their last blood or their mama's blood to buy a plane ticket to leave Africa and come to slave trading America. The nation is so bad. The nation that took their ancestors as slaves and brought them over on ships, right? This nation is so awful, yet they will sell their mama's blood just to get here. And then when they get here, act like little girls. Don't want to be men. Or say they're Muslim. I've been around. You know why men become rosters, or at least say that they are, and wear dreads? Because they want somebody to fear them, because they ain't got no balls. And they figure the dreads will make me look like I'm bad. I'm a rasta. And rather than become Christians, these Africans, and rather than become Christians and following Jesus, they say they're Muslims because they think that Muslims are feared. Muslims will kill you. And they would try to build a self-protection around their weak asses by calling themselves Muslim. They ain't no damn Muslim. They're just weak, scared men. They're scared of their shadows. So they wear dreads. Or they put on a dashiki. And they won't confess Jesus as Lord. Jesus is a show enough warrior. <laughs> you want to be a man? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Show enough stomp down there. And we need to teach it. And don't back up. Don't back up. We get that. Men become leaders in their homes. Leaders in the church. And then we'll pray that uh, I can make it far enough to get it rolling. You know, I think Holly Selassie lived to, Father Divine lived to be 80, 89 years old. Holly Selassie lived to be 82. Marcus Garvey, they killed him. He would have, he'd be alive now had they not killed him. Uh, I'll tell you this, I'll say this, I'll get this as a, as a personal, and it is personal, it is personal. I lost my respect for Malcolm X when I learned that he divulged to the national press the private sexual activities of Elijah Muhammad. And he put it all in the newspapers as if he thought he was somebody. Now, I'm not condoning what Elijah Muhammad did. But I think what Malcolm did to expose Elijah Muhammad, who had built a 100,000-man army selling fish from Peru and newspapers on the street and opening up restaurants called the Shabazz restaurants, all that crumbled after Malcolm. And they killed him. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not condoning what, but I'm definitely, when you got men who are sneaky, who are backbiters, who don't believe in you, in the midst, you got to get rid of them. No mercy. No mercy. No mercy. They got to go. They need to leave here. No mercy. Because they'll do it. It's in them. And that's what they did to Elijah Muhammad. And they did it to Marcus Garvey. Dead at 53. Penniless. Broke. And everything he'd worked for. They disbanded. But I'm here. I'm the Lord's servant. Praise Almighty God. Amen. We can do this. Today we celebrate the white stone. Give the Lord a round of applause. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Thanks so very much. I want to announce that uh, 
Esther Butler has made a decision of the many offers that she's had from law schools here in the New York area. She's decided to accept an invitation to attend the New York Law School. Praise our mighty God. I, I, I told Esther that we need to have a meeting with several of our leaders and those in school regarding some of the things I'm talking about. Now we have a plan for this coming July about promoting some of the things that we've said here lightly and we'll see whether or not we'll do it this year or next year. Something like this, I can get arrested real quick. Uh, you've seen how they try to twist the truth to get me arrested before, all a couple of years ago. You see what they did, is tried to get me put, throw me in jail. We survived. Um, but I was actually, you know, you know, we got, we got Leah, Dr. Hartfield, and uh, we got uh, uh, Jatera, Dr. Butler, um, and I'm going to need a strong group of people that I know I can trust to, uh, to move this program forward. Uh, and it's just not the banking institution, but I need people I can trust. I need people who, uh, Virtuous Virtuous says she's going for a PhD. I may redirect it towards law school. Who knows? I may say, no, I'll do law. Uh, but I need people who are willing to understand the schematics. You know, the people like uh, uh, Elder, Elder Flannery, it's important that we learn to write decorum. If we're going to be in the United Nations, if we're going to be international banking, if we're going to meet with the Japanese banking authority, if we're going to travel the globe and set up an international organization, we got to know how to come in and go out. You just can't keep living by them old, those, those rude, crude habits. You, you need to be refined. Now, one of the great things happened is Elizabeth, Miss Ambiance herself, is teaching our vestals how to set a table how to come in, how to go out, so there are no etiquette. She's doing a great job of doing that. Y'all give her a round of applause. All the best is know that. We, to incorporate you in the things that we're talking about, you're gonna have to change. You're gonna have to grow. You're gonna have to be uncomfortable with that behavior that does not meet the standards of international business and trade. People aren't going to receive you if you just come in the wrong way. And so we may lose people because some people think, well, he ought to choose me because I've been with him a long time. That's, that's important. But this going forward may need just the youth. The sophistication of a Dr. Leah Hartfield or the soft-spoken yet eloquence of, of a Jatira Butler or a now River, or some of the younger people that are in our ministry now. And I say to you young people, the, the, the Pentateuch Vestals, don't you let nobody take you out of this church. The devil will come up to you, your family members who are not here. We're in grave danger. We're praying every day out on the floor. Because those that don't have family members seated here, those family members are going to do everything they can to take them out of here. Now they're going to say, well, we want to be family. That's a damn lie. They don't want you here with Manny. They don't want you here. They don't want what's going to happen to you. They want to have control over you. They don't want you developing. And they're going to tell you, come on and live with me for a while. Don't do it. It's the devil. Say, get behind me, Satan. But here, the sophistication of what we need to do, how to dress, how to speak, how to come in, all that's important. It makes just good business sense. And so, we thank God that Esther's going to law school. I may send some other people, I may tell go to law school. I'll go someplace, <laughs> go to business school, that we might be able to do the things we want to do. Um, but yet the R is graduating. I don't know whether it's this week or she says that uh, we'll see how, that's, how that happens. And that's good. Uh, we've done a good job with some people that will listen. And we've got some others that will, just listen to me, don't let, I'm telling you, 
go have a prayer meeting with Princess Lewis. She'll tell you. She'll tell you. She'll tell you to help me. She'll tell, don't fight me. Help me. And don't let these, these people who control the, the lesbians and gays control the media. And they will promote everybody who will promote them. Don't go for it. Turn it off. At, at any rate, um, we have got uh, graduation coming up. Uh, we've got uh, Vestals, the Vestals event later today. And I'll be assigning what we're going to be writing shortly. And I, I'm going to meet with most of y'all to uh, maybe in a week or so to go over some things. I think Sabbath is now completing her course of business administration at the master's degree level at Fordham. Is that right? That's where she's studying at present and, and business. Um, now we can do this. You got to stop letting people tell you who I am and let Jesus talk to you. And we, we, can, we can do it. No, we can. And let me lead and let me rule with a rod of iron. <laughs> and, 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 and Deuteronomy, it was a 32, 31, 32. Moses said to the children of Israel, he said, I keep these laws and all these curses won't come on you. But he said, you know what? Moses said to him, but you know what y'all going to do? Y'all going to go over there, going to eat, get full, take off your shoes. You know what you're going to do? You're going to leave God and you're going to start worshiping Black Lives Matter. He said it to him. Well, they said Black Lives Matter. But he said, I'm, like, I, I'm telling you. I said, I'm Moses, you need that. I, most if you know that's what you're going to do, we well, kill them all now. He said, no, I'm going to let you. Y'all going to do the right thing for a little while. But as soon as you get your prosperity, as soon as you get a long paycheck, you're going to start worshiping Black Lives Matter. I, I'm telling you, y'all didn't read that. Y'all didn't, didn't see that, right? Maybe y'all didn't read. Maybe y'all didn't. You saw it, right? And that's what people do here. They get a long paycheck and they forget about outlaw. They forget about Pastor Manning. And they start worshiping these other gods out there and think they're doing something so smart. Don't do it. Don't do it. All right. Uh, the time that they offer everybody giving, uh, your online giving, and just give. Listen, my brother, let me tell you something. The theme. Elder LaFleur, the theme for the graduation is outlaw students will never beg bread and will never be defeated. That's the thing. Now you don't have to worry about it because I'm due to preaching. <laughs> but an outlaw student, if you stay with outlaw, you will never beg bread and you'll never be defeated. Esther Butler, did you hear that? Well, shake your head like you heard it there. Praise Almighty God. <clears throat> 